All right, welcome to uh, Micro Lecture 5.2, The Rise of the Warrior Cop. And I promise, I know I went a little long on my last lecture, that I will keep this between 5 and 10 minutes. I'll keep it under that. I'll try to keep it right around 8 minutes. Even though I think this is a fascinating uh, topic, and I, I think for those of you interested in doing research, this is a very fertile area to talk about. Okay, so Lecture 5.2, The Rise of the Warrior Cop. Where does the term warrior cop come from? Well, this is the idea that the police are being militarized, that you are taking what Sir Robert Peel said was the alternative to military force. Remember, the, the people are the police and the police are the people. And instead, you're separating them out and you're making them into a military force. This uh, term warrior cop really got a lot of um, publicity, I guess would be the correct term, or, or cachet, uh, when the author here of uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, uh, Radley uh, Belko, wrote his book back, uh, it's almost five years ago now, it's about 2014, it came out 2015. Um, I do recommend you read that book, I think it would be uh, a useful uh, resource for you to understand a lot of this issue. Um, I know that uh, books cost money and it can be difficult and sometimes they're not available to check out in the library. So I did include a link here. Uh, Mr. Bilko was um, interviewed um, for about 42 minutes um, and that, you, that um, interview is posted on YouTube. So if you want to cut and paste and watch that interview, I think it's pretty interesting. His background is um, he is a reporter. Um, so this isn't social science um, criminolo criminologist doing research, but he does back it up with a lot of uh, information. Okay, so what are we talking about as militarization? Well, one of the examples, and this isn't the sole thing, but it's one that people tend to focus on, is SWAT teams. So SWAT teams, um, the first SWAT team was created in Los Angeles in 1964. So I included over there one of the uh, logos for them. Um, and the SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. Now, sometimes you hear it, uh, that it stands for a Special Weapons uh, and Assault Team, uh, Special Weapons Assault Team, then they drop the and. So uh, it can mean whatever you prefer, but the, the actual name started with Special Weapons and Tactics. Um, also, there's some... Um, some people that feel that SWAT is a, a derogatory term now or one that shouldn't be used. So sometimes you'll hear it called just a special team or an assault team or uh, there's different terminology. So of course, um, there was a kind of dramatic expansion of SWAT teams. Um, by 1999, um, there were uh, SWAT teams in every state in the United States um, today. 90% of all cities, and this would include cities in North Carolina like um, uh, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, uh, have a SWAT team. About 80% of cities that are a good deal smaller than that, so these would be cities down the size of Cary or um, High Point, will have SWAT teams. And even really small towns, the smallest one I could find uh, was Middleburg, PA. Middleburg, PA is a pretty small town in Pennsylvania. And it has um, only about 1,300 people in it, and it has a SWAT team, believe it or not. So what are they used for? Well, there's a perception, um, and remember, we, we started off our lectures talking about the difference between perception and reality, but the perception is that, oh, you're going to use these SWAT teams in these really hyper-dangerous when there's a hostage situation or a terror situation. And it is absolutely true that when there is a hostage situation or when there is a terror situation, that SWAT will get deployed. What people, of course, don't appreciate is that those two situations are relatively rare. Um, now, well, maybe you might say, well, then they're going to be deployed most of the time to arrest armed or dangerous offenders. About 67% of the time when the police are chasing or attempting to apprehend an armed or dangerous offender, um, they will use a SWAT team. Unfortunately, both of these categories, the terrorist hostage or the armed defenders, are pretty rare. So SWAT teams are going to be used routinely for other operations. 
um, most SWAT teams, if you look at these two charts, and um, most SWAT teams are either used for drug searches, uh, about 62% of the time, or just executing search warrants. Uh, that's going to be about almost 80% or 79% of the time. So we could we could pick a number comfortably in between those two. Um, you know, 70 plus percent of the time, SWAT is going to be used not in hostage situations, not to apprehend armed, armed intruders, but for drugs or search warrants. I included this quote because it is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I use it a bit. If you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. P SWAT deployment has gone up so much. Not only do, do SWAT departments exist, but departments and the cities want to use them. So there are now about 100 SWAT raids a day in the United States and more than 50,000 raids in a given year. Ironically, of course, this has created some significant financial and other problems. Because SWAT teams are special, they are supposed to be better trained. So if they mess up um, and there is a lawsuit, the cities or counties that use them are much more likely to lose because the person suing them can say, well, you, you wanted this really special team to do your job and you didn't train them. You just gave them guns and told them, go, go, go. So there can be uh, serious liability issues with them. I also wanted to bring up here at the end, uh, for reasons that will be clear in a second, about how they are racially deployed. If we look at a drug offender, um, so if you're going to run a drug search, if you are searching a white suspect's house, um, and this comes out of data provided by law enforcement, uh, although it's compiled by the ACLU, you are going, if you're white, they're only going to deploy a SWAT team less than 40% of the time. If you are African-American or mixed, they are going to do, use it more than 75% of the time. So these are going, force is going to be used. Now SWAT is not the only thing we're talking about here. We're talking about when the police become militarized in response to a threat. And again, I want to circle back to the idea of perception. If you are of one race or of one age or one political point, you might have a perception. If you are the, of the other or others, you might have a different perception. So let me challenge you perhaps with our next slide. Um, about two, three weeks ago in Michigan, um, these armed protesters here, some of whom were carrying AR-15s or semi-automatic guns, went into the Michigan State House, their Capitol House. They were protesting, they were shouting, uh, they were chanting. You'll notice how they were met. They were met not with a militarized force. They were met with officers who are standing shoulder to shoulder respectfully. You notice they are not in military gear. This is definitely not a SWAT. Even though the people they are facing are armed and acting rather outrageously. Now you contrast that um, with this other photo here. Um, in this photo, you have protesters of the recent death of an unarmed black man in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who was essentially choked to death because a police officer kneeled on his neck after arresting him, already having him in handcuffs and arresting him for a nonviolent fraud offense. Um, you'll notice that the police response there is dramatically different. It's a militarized response. Now, you have to ask, uh, there's a couple questions here I think that we should all ask ourselves. Uh, obviously, the, the overt one, the easy one I would say to ask is, well, is this an example of racial prejudice? And I think that's a discussion worth having. But I think there's a secondary issue under this that we need to address as students of criminal justice. Is, is the deployment of force like this good policing? which one resulted in more problems? Which one resulted in more opposition? Which one resulted in uh, ineffective law enforcement? So going back to that quote of mine, and I know I'm running a little long here, uh, going back to that quote of mine, when if every, if the only tool you have is a hammer, if you're only going to use militarized response, then 
you're going to see a lot more of the results on the right than on the left there. I mean on the screen, not politically. All right, well, that's all I wanted to cover uh, on this micro lecture, and I will talk to you in the next one.